The state of galactic trade in our solar system involves Jupiter's hub and ET attitudes towards rival space alliances. A summary of Colonel Carl Nell's presentation at the May 20 to 21 SALT conference in New York City. Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet's thought on a controlled disclosure plan. Louis Elizondo's book, Imminent, Inside the Pentagon's Hunt for UFOs, will be published in August of 2024. Visit to the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza and inside its famous sarcophagus. Recent initiatives point to the Vatican preparing the faithful for disclosure of extraterrestrial life. These stories and more on Exopolitics Today, the Week in Review. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here is Dr. Michael Sala. Welcome to Exopolitics Today, the week in review for May 25. You'll have to excuse me if I don't sound uh, my normal self. I do uh, have some kind of bug that's trying to assert itself over me, but I'll do my best to. Uh, give you a presentation of the week's topics uh, that cover exopolitics developments. So here is uh, something that, uh, well, this is the World Religions and Extraterrestrial Contact Disclosure webinar I did back in uh, August of 2022, part two has now been released. So this is very interesting. It, it covers uh, different world religions and how they deal with extraterrestrial life. And later on in the week in review, I'll be talking about the Vatican playing a big role in what's in what's to come. And so, yeah, this webinar will introduce you to the, the major world religions and how they deal with uh, extraterrestrial contact. So that's now available for free on my website. Okay, so here's a, a fascinating update on the state of galactic trade in our solar system that involves Jupiter as the hub and extraterrestrial attitudes towards rival space alliances led by uh, the US, there's the Artemis Accords, and China, uh, which has the International Lunar Research Station. So this is the Star Nations News weekly episode that Elena Danan does, and uh, her information comes from representatives of the Galactic Federation as they reveal information to her, and it is quite fascinating, it gives you an insight into what may be happening, uh, not just in our solar system, but in the wider galaxy. So definitely very interesting information. And I, I think anything to do with uh, events on the moon, on, on um, Jupiter, the hub, and of course these rival space alliances, uh, Artemis Accords and the uh, China and Russia's International Lunar Research Station, you know, those are things that are confirmable. So uh, I think it's well worth taking a look at that update. Here is uh, something. Uh, this was a UFO researcher, Vicky Verma. He posted a story about the Cash Land Landrum family that experienced severe radiation sickness after being close to a UFO with an exhaust which was followed by US helicopters. So this is a, a very famous case because it was there was a big court case and uh, ultimately they did not win the court case because you, you had this diamond shaped UFO that you can see here and it was being followed by these, uh, I guess, what are they? Those are the Chinook helicopters. And so here are the, uh, the wounds, the burns, radiation sickness uh, suffered by the members of the Landrum Family. So that, all that was presented in, in court, and I, I guess the judge ruled that there wasn't sufficient evidence to uh, give them an award against the government uh, because they had no photos or anything like that of the UFO or video of the UFO. Now, the interesting thing about the uh, this 1980 case is that Richard Doty, who, who's a former Air Force Office of Special Investigations agent, uh, claims that he debriefed uh, the pilots and crew involved in that in that particular crash, and uh, he verified that it really did happen. That there was some experimental craft that was being flight tested, and and as I recall, uh, he debriefed the pilots flying that 
uh, diamond-shaped craft rather than helicopters. Now, I'm, I'm not 100% on that, uh, but as I recall, it was uh, the, the, that these were test pilots and that this was some kind of, well, I guess you would call it an alien reproduction vehicle uh, or, or something uh, that was needing flight testing and, and being escorted, a military escort. So there's no wonder that this, this would have been a very highly classified program, a special access program, and that that would have been something that uh, the military would not have allowed uh, news to get out of. So that's clearly why the, the Landrum family didn't win their lawsuit. So here's a, a summary of Colonel Carl Nell's presentation at the May 2021 SALT conference in New York City. So this is a Liberation Times article. <laughs> and the Liberation Times is a blog site that's run by uh, Christopher Sharp out of England. And he does a number of uh, very succinct articles on various UFO topics. So here he did a overview of Colonel Nell's presentation at that SALT conference. And uh, there uh, Nell made the case that in his view, there's zero doubt that non-human intelligence is interacting with hum humanity. And he warns of catastrophic disclosure. So he, he makes the case for a controlled disclosure process where, as the name suggests, uh, disclosure would be conducted in a way that society could handle it without too much disruption. And at the end of the day, uh, society, and we're talking about the United States and the rest of humanity, uh, would, would be able to deal with the advanced technologies and, pardon me, and news of non-human intelligence. And, and he con contrasts that with um, catastrophic disclosure, which he, he thinks would be something that could lead to the collapse of Western civilization. So let's take a look here at this idea that w Western civilization would, would collapse if you, you did have some kind of catastrophic disclosure. Now, in, on this particular issue, there, there was a report that was um, commissioned uh, by the US Congress and NASA uh, commissioned the Brookings report to deliver a report to, to NASA and to, to the US Congress about what would be the consequences of any announcement concerning the discovery of extraterrestrial life. So that was in 1960. And so the conclusion was that if society was told that extraterrestrials are visiting us and that they possess all these advanced technologies that make many of our scientific theories obsolete, that that would be a catastrophic development. <laughs> Pardon me. So the thing, though, here is that, you know, that was in 1961. Now, it's been more than 60 years, and in that time, uh, there has been not only a, a lot of technological development uh, across across uh, the spectrum, uh, maybe apart from the transportation uh, spec uh, system, because we're still using liquid propulsion technologies, uh, gas, kerosene, petrol, that sort of thing. Uh, but as far as communications is, is concerned, uh, there, there has been quite an advance. Uh, but the big difference is that in the subsequent 60 years, there's been a lot of people that have been acclimat acclimated to the idea of uh, extraterrestrial visitation. Now, here is uh, Admiral Rear, uh, Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet's thought on Colonel Nell's SALT presentation and the benefits of a controlled disclosure plan. So, okay, so this is what he has to say on this. Uh, that he, he agrees that uh, there is no doubt that there is non-human intelligence visiting us. Okay, and then, then he says um, we need a controlled disclosure plan of what the U.S. government knows about UAPs. And, and at one, he comes up with three reasons. Address a moral imperative. The public has a right to know the nature of reality, which, which should not be exclusive to the government. 
the pursuit of happiness requires it. So yeah, sure, there's a there's a moral imperative here, but I mean, do does government operate on on morality and ethics? And uh, I mean, you would think in theory that the House of Representatives is what would bring in that moral imperative, but when you look closely at the democratic system of government, uh, by by far the majority of uh, members of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives in the US, and the same would go for other countries, uh, they're controlled by lobbyists. And these are lobbyists for major corporations. And in the US, the, the, you know, the, the biggest corporations are the military industrial complex. And, and we should never forget that President Eisenhower, his speech was really, his farewell speech in 1961 was really about the military industrial congressional complex. He understood that the Congress is beholden to the military industrial sector. So um, the, the moral imperative, uh, I think, yes, in principle, but we know government doesn't work that way. Correct legal and unethical conduct, unelected officials are failing to allow congressional oversight of the programs and protocols involving UAP. Uh, so yes, there are a lot of illegal activities and unethical activities, and they largely pertain to the development of this huge black budget. Now, there are two black budgets, the official black budget, which is the money that goes to the uh, US intelligence community, that's a roughly around 70 to $80 billion a year. And then there's an unofficial black budget, uh, which is run by the CIA, and that uses funds gathered from all over the world through illicit activities. And that, that generates off the books closer to a trillion dollars a year, a trillion dollars. Think of that. The, the, the Pentagon's budget today is roughly just over $800 billion. So that's more than the Pentagon's budget that goes into generating this vast black budget that the CIA gets and then pumps through the Pentagon, and then that's that's what funds the deep underground military bases, that's what funds the um, the secret space programs. And three, benefit humanity, the science and technology breakthrough that can be accomplished by dedicated research into UOP could be transformative. So, you know, what he's talking about here is that uh, there, there has been a lot of research done on the UOP phenomenon. Uh, you know, you go back to, say, these uh, DERD reports, that's Defence Intelligence Reference Documents, that were designed, I think there was about 38 of them, that came out in uh, around 2007, 2008. Um, and, and they were funded through this money that the, that the uh, Senator Harry Reid ar arranged to be put through uh, the Bigelow Aerospace Corporation. So the idea is, you know, you, if you include that and other kind of science and technological breakthroughs uh, done by UFO researchers, um, uh, or well, actually anything associated with UFOs rather than just UFO research, that could be transformational. Well, you know, the, the thing is that uh, these have all. This has all already happened. It's happened in the classified world. The science and technology breakthroughs are all classified. And uh, as far as the kind of ethical and the illegal activities side of things, uh, I, I don't think that's going to be exposed through any kind of controlled disclosure plan. I mean, if, if you want to do controlled disclosure, uh, how, how are you going to expose all of this stuff that's been happening illegally? So I think I, I'm more in favour of a of a um, catastrophic disclosure scenario where it's not something that is controlled by the government because if it is controlled by the government, you can be sure that a lot of these ethical, illegal activities that are going on are not going to be exposed. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in favour of catastrophic disclosure, something along the lines of, uh, the the benevolent ET suddenly showing up, space arcs suddenly showing up, and you know there you have it. Like they're here, they've been here a long time. The governments were hiding it all this time, and and they'll have a lot of explaining to do. Okay, Louis Elizondo. So Louis Elizondo's book, Imminent Inside the Pentagon's Hunt for UFOs, will be published in August of 2024. Okay, so you know Louis Elizondo. For those that don't know, I mean he was the individual within the Pentagon that headed the 
Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP, from its uh, formation around 2007-2008. Uh, he headed it for five years and then it then it kind of got buried within the Pentagon structure. And ostensibly, around 2017, he resigned from the Pentagon because he felt that the UFO issue wasn't being taken seriously. So, you know, that he was a he was a major factor in that New York Times article that came out in uh, what was it, November, December uh, 2017, that kind of made the UFO issue front and center a major policy issue that couldn't be ignored anymore. So he's he's um, an important player when it comes to this kind of official disclosure process, because you know he was former military, uh, he did have the credentials that, and uh, it, documents do show that he did run for some period uh, this eight eight pro program within the Pentagon. Now, you know, this is where we have to kind of understand that, you know, what's going on here? What I mean, I think he can be he can be completely genuine in terms of he personally believing that the Pentagon wasn't conducting a serious study into UFOs and, and he wanted to do everything he could to expose that and, and take the UFO issue seriously. So he could be... Um, legitimately, he could be someone that was doing that out of conviction. But I, I think that if we look at the Pentagon as an institution, uh, of course, there are elements within the Pentagon that do know exactly what UFOs are, that they are the craft belonging to these non-human intelligences, and that the ATIP program was, wasn't really a serious effort to understand this at all. It was just a cover program. So I, I think at best, you know, given that Lou Elizondo seems to be very sincere in his belief that the ATIP program was not being seriously funded and not being seriously supported, that he may be completely sincere in that and, and he's wanting to put that information out. But we know that the Pentagon uh, you know, did not regard ATIP as a serious effort to understand what's going on. So I, I think... Elizondo is at, at best, and that is him being sincere in wanting to get the information out. He's at best promoting a limited hangout. Now, what is a limited hangout? It's where you put out a, a part of the truth, but not the whole truth. And, you know, you could be quite sincere, like Elizondo appears to be quite sincere, um, uh, but you could still be pushing a, a limited hangout. Um, at worst, I mean, he may be part of a psyop. Okay, so here, that's me, yes, that's me. I, I went on a two-week tour uh, visiting pyramids, temples uh, in Egypt with uh, Sarah Breskin and Cosme and Susan Spooner. They organized it. Uh, we were accompanied by a professional archaeologist, uh, and, uh, and it was really amazing because the uh, arrangements were made for us to be able to do things that are off the beaten path in terms of uh, normal tourism. So, and one of the things that we were able to do was to go into the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And there's a, a sarcophagus there. It's about uh, seven foot long and about four foot wide, five foot wide. And so I was able to go into that for a few minutes and just kind of lie in there and, and meditate and people were chanting all around us. And and, and what I felt was that uh, there was a real powerful magnification or amplification of the energies that were being generated in that room. So I'm lying inside the sarcophagus. There's about 30 people around me and they're all uh, uh oming and and chanting and so forth and you could really feel the energy within that sarcophagus so i have no doubt that that sarcophagus has been designed as some kind of energy amplification system so that whatever's being generated within that in that room is something that uh is, is magnified tremendously so if you go in there and meditate then uh, you your meditations will be tremendously enhanced. Uh, apparently, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte spent a night in the in the in this uh, sarcophagus uh, when he went to Egypt with uh, the, the French Revolutionary Army, and uh, his life changed apparently after spending a night there. So it definitely is an incredible experience. Now, professional archaeologists will say, and this is something that the public is 
told that the, the Great Pyramid and that this king's chamber is in fact a burial tomb. There's nothing special about it. It's just a burial tomb where uh, you you had uh, one of the one of the pharaohs uh, buried. Now, I can say that uh, being inside the king's chamber and looking at the walls, the walls are, are totally bare. Now, I was also able to go to the Valley of the Kings, where you you have the the pharaohs being buried. And they did have tombs for the pharaohs. Yeah, the mummies were discovered inside of those tombs there in the Valley of the Kings. And the walls are just filled with inscriptions and cartouches about the life of that emperor. But none of that is in the Great Pyramid in that uh, king's chamber. So to me, that's evidence that this was not a burial tomb at all, but it was some kind of a energy amplification, ascension chamber. So very... Uh, very interesting. And so I, I've released uh, an interview I did with uh, Sarah uh, already, and, and I'll be releasing another interview with Suzanne uh, next week on, on Monday. So you'll get to uh, the chance to kind of hear more about that tour and what was covered and what the implications are for exile politics. So here's the, um, here's the, Interview I did with uh, Sarah Breskman. Now, you know, to my mind, you know, people people might have questions about quantum healing hypnosis technique. Uh, that technique that was pioneered by Dolores Cannon. Now, I've, I've read uh, Dolores Cannon's, uh, I think, about six of her books, and I must say uh, that they are filled with really helpful information. Uh, concerning exopolitics. Now, of, of course, you know, in conducting exopolitics research, uh, the important thing always is, okay, you know, where, what are our sources? So we have the conventional sources. You, know, you, you have your photographs, you have your documents, you have your videos showing craft. Uh, you might have physical contactee reports telling us well, what's happening, whether a person's been abducted, whether they've gotten voluntarily into the craft, so those first-hand reports. And all of that is very, very important. And a lot of my research, exopolitics research, has been done on that. But you know, when I got involved in this field back in uh, 2001, there were convention unconventional sources, uh, things like remote viewing. Um, Dr. Courtney Brown, uh, he, Dick Olgaier, uh, they are some of the people I've interviewed, and they all have remote viewing programs that, that give us a lot of data on the extraterrestrial phenomena. So that's all part of the exopolitics field. Uh, channeling. Now, now, channeling is a much more controversial field uh, because, you know, to my mind, you know, there, there are channels that have stood the test of time and, and have had some scientific rigor behind it. So if you look at, say, the, um, the channeling of Phyllis Schlemmer in The Only Planet of Choice, uh, they they used a Faraday cage, and and then you have uh, Don Elkins and Carla Rukert who have generated the Law of One. Uh, they also use a very strict protocol to make sure that that there was a communication with a non-human intelligence that was coming through. Now you know there's a lot of channelers today who who really don't do uh, any anything like that. They'll they'll just kind of like say, okay, uh, you, you want to ask Sananda something, and Sananda we, Sananda's coming through, and Sananda telling is telling me uh, you know, whatever about you, and then it's like, oh, okay, now oh, well, the Hathors are on the line now. Hang on, hang on, the Hathors are on the line, and so uh, the, I'll tell you the Hathors are giving information. Oh, hang on, there's another signal coming in from the Sirius star system. Now, you know, the problem with that is that. Um, if you're just an open channel and you get information from all these different sources, I mean, how do you discern the good from the bad and the ugly? Now, is that important to do? Well, we do know it is. Uh, Ed, Edgar Casey, probably the most famous uh, trans medium channeler, um, he, he said that for a period of time, I think it was just over a year, he was channeling an entity that was masquerading as a positive one. So he had he had a protocol in place where he was able to discern that uh, the information he was putting out was actually being corrupted. So there's good channeling, bad channeling. So where, where does that take us to QHHT? Okay, QHHT I think is one of these unconventional sources uh, where you get people to go into their uh, past lives. And a skilled 
uh, QHT practitioner. I think there are three levels that Dolores Cannon taught. And Sarah Breskman is at the highest level, that which is uh, level three. And, and they put people under. And, and I, I've been exposed to this. Uh, my wife has been exposed to this. And it seems to be a very good way of being able to access not only past life memories, but also the higher self, which gives information about those lives and provides a wider context into you know why you lived that life, why you had to go through a life of misery and suffering as a pauper, say, in revolutionary France. Why was that important in terms of your soul evolution? And so they'll, they'll do things like that. And, that. and that does promote healing because this is actually quantum hypnosis healing technique. So the, the primary focus is on applying the, the past life memories to your current life in a way that promotes healing and health. And that's, and that's really very important to understand that uh, the QHHT practitioners are not there to you know, gather exopolitics information. You know, that's a byproduct, but their primary role is to heal people. It's a, it's a, it's, and it's a very effective strategy or very effective technique for healing people. And so my limited exposure to QHT shows that it, it does heal people. You know, people have had all sorts of illnesses. Uh, Dolores Cannon has covered this. Sarah, Sarah Bressman has, has covered this. Uh, Suzanne Spooner has also discussed this, that people that do this technique are healed from very serious techniques. But nevertheless, even though the primary focus is on healing and health and helping the person who need who's going through the QHHT to kind of like um, develop an understanding of you know, why they feel the way they do their life circumstances. A byproduct is information about past lives and extraterrestrials, and so that I think is very very helpful information. And and to me, uh, in in doing exopolitics research, I think it's very important uh, for triangulation. I, I like to triangulate. I, I mean, I like to get the conventional. Uh, sources, so whether it's a it's a, a leaked document or a, a FOIA document or a photo, video, whistleblower report, a contactee report, and triangulate, like bring in, okay, what, what are the remote viewers telling us about that? What, what, what are the channelers saying about that? What what are the QHHT telling us about that? And and you you kind of like you you discern the most reliable from the least reliable, and and, and that's part of the process. You've got to discern the you know the bad from the good. And and, and in Sarah Bressman's case, I think she is uh, really one of the top QHT practitioners, and uh, she is viewed by many within that field as the true successor to Dolores Cannon. So. Uh, you can watch the interview about that. Okay, so here is a story about the Vatican. Now, the, the Vatican being involved in uh, the process of dropping bombshells about UFOs, aliens, and, and apparitions. So that the, the Vatican has uh, convened a, a a press conference where there there was topics discussed on on these issues and this was the first time since apparently 1978 that the Vatican had done this so why now why is the Vatican doing doing this now well we know there are well over a billion Catholics all over the world and while Catholicism uh, in the United States might not be a big deal it is a big deal in many other parts of the world so if the Vatican says that well extraterrestrials are our brothers and that extraterrestrials can be baptized, then that's going to send a very important message to, to, the, to the Catholic community, to Christians, because there are many Christians, especially in the evangelical world, who uh, believe that extraterrestrials are demons. I mean, that is un the unfortunate, sad truth. Now, I've spoken to Timothy Alberino, who I, th I think is really um, a, a very fine Christian scholar or into the UFO issue, into this issue of extraterrestrials. And and um, and he is one of the few that is able to uh, differentiate between the good, the bad, and the ugly. That, yes, there's, there's you know, you span the spectrum when it comes to extraterrestrials. So uh, here's one example. But there are many other evangelical Christian 
uh, authors talking about UFOs that are really making the case that that the, these are demons and that you want to have nothing to do with them. And if you do have anything to do with uh, extraterrestrials, then uh, you are, you're under some kind of possession by a demonic force. And uh, th that is um, the unfortunate truth with the evang evangelical community. But the uh, the Catholic world is being steered down another path. They're being told by Catholic theologians, by the Pope, that extraterrestrials are our brothers, our galactic brothers, and that they can be baptised because they have a higher ethical uh, foundation that, that, than we do, uh, that their ethics are sufficiently high that they're not going to be as, uh, let's, let's just say, as corrupt as human society, uh, but not so sufficiently high that uh, they have no need for Christian theology because the idea is that Christian theology, you know, teaching about the life and times of Jesus Christ, is is a, a, a salvific event. So that's what the Catholics believe, and uh, I think it's a it's a much more sensible approach. Now, you know, the, the the irony here is that the Vatican itself has been infused or corrupted by a, a kind of like an off-world reptilian group. So it is very complex. It is a, an issue we need to be wary of. Uh, the, the Vatican pushing this at this time, given their historic role in covering up the truth concerning extraterrestrial life, given the, the fact that the the highest level of the Vatican hierarchy have been controlled by these Draco reptilians. Uh, that gives us cause for caution about why the Vatican is, you know, getting the faithful ready for some kind of announcement concerning UFOs and aliens. Is the Vatican part of a potential false flag alien event. There, there are a lot of rumors that we are about to witness that, that the deep state has played all its cards to maintain power and has failed in, in playing all of these cards. And so one of, the, one of the few cards it has left is a fake alien invasion. All right, so that's, that's about it for this week in review for uh, May uh, 25. Uh, thank you for listening. Don't forget to uh, like and share this this post and help overcome the YouTube censorship. So uh, thank you and aloha. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit Exopolitics Today. Dot com. Mm -hmm.